must be just a matter of seconds before the northern region adds itself to the independent television network. The signal is coming up clearly, he says. We're getting the network on our monitors beautifully. The count will begin now. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Granada were perhaps the first modern television company in the UK, in that it was a company first and a television company second. TV was just one of many pies into which it stuck its incredibly long fingers. Others included overpriced bacon sandwiches and the long-forgotten industry of electronics rentals. The adverts for the latter rather ostentatiously promised great service and great sex which must have exhausted the late Kenneth MacDonald no end. And this combination of half-assed lip-syncing, character actor prostitution and gratuitously jiggling breasts was clearly a great success because there were loads of Granada rental shops when I was a kid. In fact, we had a Granada rental set in our house, which meant that our telly box had the same funny-looking logo on it that half the programmes had. This gave the tiny infant me the impression that the programmes were made inside the box itself, by little Keebler elves wearing armbands emblazoned with that G-arrow thing. No wonder I turned out the way I did. And it's a funny name as well. I mean, after nearly 60 years, it's unquestionably normal these days. Manchester, Liverpool, Bolton, Blackburn. Granada land. Fait accompli. But if you actually think about it, what on earth does Granada have to do with its location? There's no place in the country called Granada, so where the hell do they come from? Well, the answer is, they came out to the head and brain of this man, Sidney the Baron Bernstein. Which does suggest that Granada, and by extension ITV itself, are part of the international Zionist conspiracy, but we knew that already. Granada the company was set up by Sidney and his brother Cecil, way, way back in 1930, when the idea of any national television at all was still only water in a stranger's tear. This initial incarnation had the full name Granada Theatres Limited. It was a cinema chain. Twenty years and one more later, the television, in the shape of the BBC, had all but caught up with the cinema in terms of popularity, but all indications were that just as soon as more people in the country could actually watch the damn thing, it would lap it like Usain Bolt on an elderly person's fun run. With this in mind, and with independent television finally given the go-ahead in the early 50s, the Bernsteins decided to dip their toes into the waters of the small screen. As I said, we all know where Granada land is. It's in the north, the northwest specifically. But Granada the company was, at least originally, about as northern as Danny Dyer. The Bernsteins were old-fashioned Tottenham-supporting, Labour-voting, London Jewish boys. Becoming ITV in the North was purely a business decision. The other two choices were London itself, which Granada passed on as soon as they saw their rival bids and clocked that they had no chance, and the Midlands, which I actively turned down on the grounds that the Midlands are boring. Apparently. So they took the North of England contract. At the time, that meant almost the entire top third of the nation, from Liverpool to Hull, and including all of Yorkshire. Let's not sell them too short, however. Unlike Carlton, or indeed their own future selves, Granada under the Bernsteins might have had a cavalier approach to choosing a region, but having picked one, they did at least cultivate a healthy respect for, and even liking of, the people who lived there as opposed to blank disinterest at best and naked contempt at worst, as demonstrated in the 90s. 
and their initial branding and packaging demonstrated a distinctly northern outlook, from the proud, if tautological, slogan to the abundance of upward-pointing arrows. Arrows would be a signature part of Granada's visual identity, right up to the point when they deliberately divested themselves of one. At first, they didn't get the idea of linking the arrow with the letter G, but they made up for that with some rather trendy pop artish lettering. That font, a grotesque named Stymie, fact fans, would come to be associated with them even after they dropped it for something blander, thanks to the sign outside their studios, not to mention their service stations. What was missing from these idents, from all Granada idents for the longest time, was the spark of life. Oh, occasionally they'd move, but there was never any sound. According to Granada, this is because they wanted their programs to speak for themselves. In case you weren't aware, this is back in the days when idents served a dual purpose. For the people watching the channel, they were your basic station identification. Elsewhere in the nation, on programs the company had made for national broadcast, the idents would run before the title sequence, like this. Sometimes they'd even incorporate the ident into the titles themselves. This practice was largely abandoned in the mid-80s with the rise of independent production companies, but this is why, on repeats of Coronation Street from before 1985 or so, you tend to start with a couple of seconds of the theme tune playing over a blank screen. That's where the old Granada Presents caption would have gone. Unmoving, and in its own right, silent. Not that Granada didn't know how to have fun, in fact, it was probably the most relaxed out of the four ITV launch companies. It even embraced the swinging 60s. That thing served partly to introduce the new and now iconic Arrowed G logo, which I spent many a morning of sums-related drudgery trying to draw, although I never managed it. They adopted the logo in 1968 to celebrate retaining the franchise. They did lose Yorkshire, which got its own service, but to make up for it, they became a seven-day station for the first time, after 12 years of ABC at the weekend. Don't worry, we'll get back to ABC later in the series. The Arrow G would remain for the rest of the Granada brand's natural life, only being dropped in the mid aughties long after the point where it mattered anymore. Fortunately, despite the reduced territory, they resisted the temptation to have the arrow bend and point to the left because that would look silly. As it was, it was sharp, modern, and even dynamic, at least in theory. I say that because in practice, it still didn't do anything. From the late 60s right through the 70s and on into the 80s, the logo and name would just fade in, wait for the continuity announcer to do their thing, if they hadn't already, and then fade out again silent and unchanging the whole time. To be fair to them, this did tie in with the regional identity. After all, it's grim up north. All right, I'm being unfair. I'm making Granada sound like a stone-faced, coal-fired, slate-grey carnival of frowning just because its ident didn't move. But of course, this was back in the days where the ident was only half of the station's presentation. The other half being the faces of the InVision continuity. Granada were blessed with some of the best, including the Demon Headmaster, the intense Jim Pope, seen here imitating Jean Valjean, whose signature move was to audibly turn his microphone off at close down. A safe and peaceful night. Good night. See? And the undisputed king, Colin West. Basically a giant stuffed bear in a sweater vest and a man impossible to dislike. Seriously, if he gave a Nazi salute on air, you would just chortle gently. Although I feel I must make it clear that giving a Nazi salute is something he would never have done. Granada never had an equivalent of Gus Honeybun, but with Colin around, they didn't need one. He was Gus and Ian Sterling all rolled into one. And Granada kept faith with IVC for longer than... Almost anyone, with 
Colin and friends still live and visible and introducing programming as late as 1996. Well, then on Wednesday night, more period drama with Sharp at 8, and Thursday sees more zany and rich owners of, I must admit... So just because they were in the North didn't mean they couldn't have fun. Particularly at Christmas, when they pull all the stops out. They'd even have their logo move about a bit. Alright, so there was still no music, but look, animation! This one's from 1983. Note the freshly minted CGI logo. That would soon be pressed into service in the normal ident as Grada's only sop to the Channel 4 influence wave of computer generated presentation. You don't need no bloody objects flying through space up here. You got our name and a logo, and that's enough for us. Granada always excelled at festive presentation, which many companies didn't bother with at all. Although, to be fair, that was generally because they couldn't afford to. A problem that was never likely to affect Granada in the slightest. By the 80s, they were the last survivor of the original four franchisees, the elder statesmen of ITV. And, not coincidentally, the company behind its biggest program. How Coronation Street has survived 60 years with such a depressing theme tune is beyond me. And then there was World in Action, the hard-hitting, free jazz panorama on steroids, whose cancellation in 1998 effectively signals Granada's transition from stately pillars of broadcasting to bottom-line obsessed product wars. And since they made World in Action, it also follows that they're responsible for the legendary Up documentaries. And don't forget Bride's Head Revisited, The Jewel in the Crown, the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes series. They didn't quite have the legacy of a Thames or an ATV in terms of sheer numbers, they made up for it in density. With a portfolio like that, they hardly needed movie night events. They were Granada. They're still in silent idents with a TV equivalent of Superman staring you down with his arms crossed. Over the course of 20 years since the Arrow G's introduction, the ident only changed in the simplest ways, going blue and yellow instead of black and white, and uh, at one point redrawing the logo to make it a bit more short and squat. Still, there was the odd special occasion, like anniversaries. Yes, on their 30th birthday, Granada gave their viewers the gift of sound and vision, and a little nostalgia. Although this would seem to be a perfect mid-80s ident, it turned out only to be a temporary gift, like one of those plastic cards you buy at the supermarket for clothes stores and the like, which are basically the equivalent of saying you have no idea what someone wants except in the most general sense, and quite frankly, you've given up trying. Where was I? Oh yes, after the anniversary celebrations, it was straight back to the northern austerity, albeit with a fresh coating of bling. And even that seemed to be a little unpalatable as the chunky gold lettering was toned down to a more stately silver. Unless that's supposed to be platinum, in which case they've actually traded up. But apart from the occasional seasonal variation, which seemed to have appeared out of sheer boredom, this one denotes spring, Branding in Granada was pretty much the same as it ever was, until 1989. In 1989, ITV introduced a generic look, intended to boost the network's profile ahead of the big changes in 1990. This is Granada's ident. Or it would have been. In the event, Granada, like TSW, rejected the imposition. Ironic, really, given that ten years later they would own half the network and be behind the next attempt at this sort of thing. But at this point, however, they were still proud of being Granada, and felt they had too distinct and powerful an identity to throw it away for some dream of homogenousness. It surely didn't help that whoever designed this thing completely messed up Granada's version of the ident. Even at the age of five, doodling in the Granada logo instead of doing sums, I'd know better than to leave off the vertical line under the arrow. It's not an accent. 
I've complimented the 1989 IDB generic look, but it did have one fundamental problem, and that was its insistence baiting itself around that little triangle at the end. That wasn't going to work with every logo. We've seen two so far, and neither was a great fit, and we're going to see more. This ident may not have been transmitted, at least not in this form, but it did throw into sharp relief the fact that the Granada idents were a bit boring. Especially in 1989, when everyone else on ITV was flinging metallic chunks of CGI through existential voids to form inscrutable icons. Even channel television had a computer-generated animation by now, for heaven's sake. Perhaps recognising this, and also wanting to really insist on their own identity in the face of the generic invasion, Renata made their biggest change ever. Welcome to the New School. They still pointedly eschewed the actual current Vogue, however. It's resolutely two-dimensional, low-key, and even shy, with the scudding clouds and the translucent G rather painfully resized out of its normal proportion. The focus on granite grey skies was not only appropriate for the area, considering the natural climate of the northwest of England, but also perfect for those occasions when you really want to compromise with ITV. ITV is brought to you by Granada. And don't you forget it. If the main ident could be described as demure, the variation for explicitly local programming made up for it, looking and sounding something like a specialist release on the ZTT label. Most bizarre of all, the Christmas ident that year actually propped the logo up in the background, half obscured by a revolving chain of paper children. These idents, I have to say, look suspiciously rushed, as if the generic ITV movement took Granada by surprise when they slapped this together at the last minute. They do anticipate the current and seemingly invincible trend towards idents with logos slapped atop live action footage, but with the simplistic animation and visibly distorted logo, it's easy to come to the conclusion that it's using live action for cheapness and utility, rather than for any kind of aesthetic reasons. I could very easily be wrong, of course. These are well over a quarter of a century old, after all. I very much doubt even the original designers could remember what they were trying to get at, if anything, or be bothered to make the attempt to do so. And it doesn't matter anyway, because, to add to the suspicions about their rushed appearance, within 18 months they were replaced by something so professional and classy looking, it even made BBC One look a bit HTV by comparison. The Stripe, as it was nicknamed for obvious reasons, may not be the most exciting ident ever made, but it's a design classic. It's clear, it's crisp, it's focused, and unlike the previous set, it's confident. And just in time for the 1990 Broadcasting Act to arrive and change the face of independent television for the worse. What better way to prepare for the inevitable new franchise round than with a relaunch that underlines in felt tip A. Granada's inherent classiness and B. Its supreme confidence in winning the franchise again. After all, why would you introduce such a cohesive new look if you were sincerely entertaining the notion that it couldn't last more than two years? So when the blind auction franchise round came along in 1991, Granada bid a relatively modest, if still substantial, £9 million. Pounds. I mean, who was going to come up against them? <laughs> Phil Redmond, that's who. Only someone like him could take on the mighty Granada. Someone whose balls are dwarfed only by his ego. And he outbid them too. With his Mersey Productions, restyled Northwest Television for the purpose, putting up a colossal £35 million, pounds, dwarfing Granada's seemingly complacent bid like Tyrion Lannister on the surface of the sun. For a few seconds there, Granada looked like the perfect, overconfident Goliath, about to be slain by David. But there was a tiny, confident smile on the collective face of the company, because they knew something that Redmond didn't. 
how the quality threshold worked. Well, they couldn't have it all come down to just how much money you had. That wouldn't be fair. So anyone going up against an established station would have to first outbid them and then cross a fairly nebulous quality hurdle that completely coincidentally, Granada had helped the ITC draw up. On top of that, remember how I said Granada made some of ITV's most popular shows? Well, had they lost the franchise, Granada had already made plans to sell those shows to satellite television. And we're talking about programs like Prime Suspect, Cracker, World in Action, and some ongoing drama about a street or something. All of them gone to Sky or BSB. To no one's great surprise, Mersey didn't make it. Granada won the franchise back with a relatively modest annual fee. Over the next few years, Stripes Hill would be refined and versioned to within an inch of its life. Not that it had a life, it's a computer-generated drawing of a perpendicular blue oblong, enclosing a stylized uppercase G. Why would you anthropomorphize it? What's wrong with you? Anyway, like I was saying, over the next few years it was version city for the striped logo. It was heavily backlit for those chilly winter evenings. It had the G ensconced within a snow globe for Christmas in 1992. It was even set on fire to support Manchester's ultimately for the 2000 Olympics. Oh, cheer up, you got the Commonwealth Games instead. You could never have outdone Sydney anyway. By now, the G Arrow was a fully fledged icon, with enough pop cultural clout to effectively shout the word Granada in the heads of everyone who so much as glanced at the benighted thing, whether there was any accompanying text or not. Promotional stings like this one from 1992 were increasingly treating it as a fetish object. Television worth watching soon became altogether too self-effacing a slogan for Granada after 1993, when the next phase of the Broadcasting Act's dismantling of ITV came into play. Companies could now buy each other out. And Granada didn't waste any time in beginning the shopping spree that would end with them and Carlton effectively the only games in town. By 1994, they'd already absorbed LWT into their vast mass. The remerged Yorkshire Tinties would soon follow. They needed a new, grander image to fit their explicitly megalomaniacal outlook. And what better image for a company intent on conquest? than a flag. Designed, produced, directed, probably catered by the pop art legend Peter Phillips, suddenly Granada were leading the Cultural Revolution. No longer were they merely making television worth gawping listlessly at while you scoop spoonfuls of mushy peas into your chops. Now they were setting the standard. The standard for what I leave to your rapier wit, but it can't be denied that this newly bullish image was reflected in Granada's actions at the time, as they ultimately scooped up even more ITV franchises than Carlton. Technically, these were created as promotional stings rather than idents, but they were still used as such on occasion, usually before the news or local programming. Can you imagine if we were still using Granada Presents captions and Coronation Street was preceded by this? Well, whatever they were for, the flag videos were so impressive that when new idents did come along in 1995, Peter Phillips was given the job of designing them. At first glance, this looks like the usual computer-generated Channel 4 frippery. But then you realise that this is just a tad on the detailed side for 1995 computer graphics. That's because it's not. Or at least the logo isn't. The stripe and the vague floaty backdrop are, but the G is a Perspex model made by Philips and shot in camera, multiple times composited together and chroma keyed onto the CGI backdrop to create an ident good enough to eat. A later variation added slit scan and coloured lighting to the mix, but was still shot entirely on camera 
with a live prop. Now we don't need no bloody computers here. Perspex models were good enough in 1983 and they're good enough now. The net result was a slightly more powerful and dynamic image, which was just as well because Granada's plans for world domination were well and truly on track. As well as hoarding the ITB regions like a fat man in a cake shop, the company also started to turn its attentions towards satellite, and more specifically the freshly minted technology of digital broadcasting. But that's a story for another time. Suffice to say, they poured a lot of money into it, and didn't get an awful lot of it back. It also didn't help that they were spreading themselves rather thinly by the end of the decade. As the 21st century dawned, practically all of England and Wales was technically Granada land. They didn't impose their name on all the other regions, unlike that other company. But one suspects that's purely because it was so iconic and heavily associated with the North West. The post-digital populism was reflected in an ultimately short-lived new set of ideas, which ranged from the stately to the nakedly surreal and the downright creepy. But these had the unfortunate status of having been introduced in 1999, which meant that mere months later, And here's the second ITV generic look, ten years on from the first, and as I said before, suspiciously similar to Carlton's at the time. These ideas weren't bad, although there were some better designs that they rejected. They were just used for evil. Or for not very good, anyway. Granada's version oddly manages to have the logo both more and less prominent than in 1989 which is clever. I wouldn't feel too sorry for them though. This was their idea. Theirs and Carlton's. It took another four years of increasingly irritating Sam and Diane flirtation before the two companies, who between them already owned every franchise in England and Wales, inevitably merged together to form ITV PLC and run the network as a single channel. Except in Scotland and Ulster. And initially the Channel Islands. The Granada name now exists solely as a dormant subsidiary of ITV PLC. They don't even have service stations anymore. But here's the thing. ITV is still divided into regions for desultory local news purposes. Very vague reasons as of late. The former TSW area is now served from Bristol, for example. But where most of them are named after their basic geography, the North West is still called ITV Granada. But if you actually think about it, what on earth does Granada have to do with its location? The Bernsteins named their cinema chain after the city in Spain because it sounded vaguely exotic. But now, in this country, it means the precise opposite. Grey-skied, rain-sodden, cobble-streeted Manchester. Granada land. The studios are gone, the letters long since taken down. But the grand old man of ITV is still going strong, even if it has to be in spite of ITV itself. <laughs>
Good night.